Hey folks, Coach Patrick here from Endurance Nation. I want to welcome you to another coach video episode. Uh, opportunity for me to talk to you about topics that are relevant to your training and racing season. Um, this is part of the educational series that we do internally for athletes, um, and we do it externally as well for you. The broader endurance community is an opportunity for you to kind of learn a little bit about how Endurance Nation approaches training, um, and how you can use these tips and tricks to make the most of your experience as well. Okay, so today's topic is resting heart rate, um, RHR. Um, it's the heart rate that most people take in the morning. Um, it's something you may get done simply on your watch. It could be something uh, when you're in bed, you could take it yourself. Um, some um, folks use applications um, that have like a pulse oximeter that you just put on your finger um, and take it before you move out of bed. But the idea here is that your resting heart rate is as close to a, a total relaxed baseline level of heart rate that we can get for you as an individual. So the way I want you to think about resting heart rate is that it's sort of like the temperature of your body in terms of the fitness load that you're carrying, right? So we understand that 98.6 degrees is sort of what is normal for um, people when we start measuring temperature. So if you have a if 100 fever, we know that relative to 98.6, that gives me a, a sense of, of how aggressive things are. If you have 103, I have a good sense of what that means, right? Um, if we never knew what 98.6 degrees was and that it was your baseline, then 100 or 101 or 40 wouldn't really make sense to us because we wouldn't have a starting point. We wouldn't have a baseline. Um, and so your resting heart rate is your personal signature of what it means to be you at rest, your sort of stable state. And we typically measure that in the morning because it's when you're the most rested in the day. Uh, for sure, if you have to get out of bed and do it or roll over and do it, the heart rate will increase a little bit. But generally speaking, if you measure it for a couple of days in a row across a general week for you, whether it includes training or not, um, what your normal cycle looks like, you'll get a baseline number. I recommend that you measure it for about five or seven days, add them all up, divide by five or seven and get the average. So my resting heart rate in the morning is right around 130 uh, beats per minute. And for me, um, you know, it varies depending on what my training load is. But for the most part, I know that I'm somewhere between 130 beats per minute, depending on what my what my training load looks like. Um, oh, I'm sorry, that's my endurance heart rate. Good God. All right, we'll try that again. So for me, I know my resting heart rate is pretty low. I've been in endurance athletics for quite some time. Um, and so I've got a stable number that I look at, you know, typically between uh, 40 um, and 55 beats, depending on um, per minute, depending on where I am in my training cycle. But I've got a good sense of where I'm at. And that number becomes critical. And it's really important to us now, which is why I'm speaking to you now, relative to what it means to be training um, indoors, um, and then also to be training outside. Um, and for most athletes, this represents a significant uptick in total training volume. So um, you've been training indoors, you've been doing a quality training program following Endurance Nation's out season, you know, doing intensity and not a ton of volume. As the weather's turned nice, now we're going to be going outside and those 90 minute rides are going to become 180 minute rides or 270 minute rides as your race approaches and we need to put in volume. That significant increase in total training load puts an additional stress on your body. And that stress can be represented in many different ways. We can look at it as time and zone. Uh, we can look at it as distance covered. We can look at it as elevation gained. Um, we can look at uh, the time and zone, not only from heart rate, but from power perspectives, all sorts of different numbers we can look at. Um, but the one that I would like you to look at first and foremost is that resting heart rate number. Okay. So if you said, if you set in your calendar, Hey, every, you know, um, second week, of the month, I'm going to do my heart rate for five days. You get a good baseline of what your resting heart rate is in you know January, February, March, April, May, um, and also a different sense of what that heart rate looks like um, early in the season under different stress versus later in the season, we have more volume and there's significantly more stress. And the reason why resting heart rate becomes a really important metric for us is that um, it is an indicator of just how much stress your body is under. So we have all sorts of algorithms and metrics through our training programs and platforms that allow us to um, associate our current state with a, a current workload. Um, but again, those are all sort of statistical analyses and are great representations of what is happening to our body. But it's not that our body is speaking out and your resting heart rate is an opportunity for your body to do just that. How is it adapting to this load? And so you'll notice as you become fatigued over time, uh, and you're experiencing stress, that that resting heart rate will typically drift higher, okay? Um, so if you're normally a baseline of 60 beats per minute, 
um, you might get up to 65 or 68 or even 70 beats per minute when your body's under load and it's under stress. It's one of those challenges that um, the adaptation period between low level of work and high level work sees your body um, unable to get back to that level of homeostasis, that happy state where it's normal and recovering. And so our challenge as endurance athletes is to add the training load, add the training stress, but make sure that we have periodic opportunities for our body to stabilize. So there's nothing, this is nothing to say that I want you to stop doing training, stop adding volume, stop adding threshold work. But what it does mean is that when you are adding that work, we expect to see the uptick, but I also want to see the adaptation phase as well, where your body adapts to the workload and is able to bring it down again and put it in a place where it can process that load. Um, that period of adaptation is critical. Um, otherwise, we keep the ramp rate so high, we're constantly adding more work. Your body never has a chance to normalize and eventually you'll break down, right? You'll, you'll hit a, a period of, um, of overtraining and fatigue and resting heart rate is that indicator. So if you have an elevated heart rate for um, you know two or three days because of a, a bigger weekend or bigger training block, that's fine. Um, if you have an elevated heart rate for several days after what you would consider to be a significant effort and your body's not adapting, then there's some level of stress your body's not able to process and we have to figure things out. So for me, when I do a bigger training block, so let's fast forward, really. So um, just got back from Mallorca, eight days of cycling, 600 miles, lots of training, pretty darn exhausted. Didn't need to take my resting heart rate to know I was exhausted. But now that I'm back, I am monitoring my resting heart rate to see um, how is my body adapting back to what is normal for me um, so I can make sure I'm ready to train. And so one of the easiest ways to do that is to not only, you know, start off easy in your workouts and just see how you feel, but also to check that resting heart rate. Right? So if you started off and you know your baseline resting heart rate is 60 beats per minute, you did a bunch of training, now you're back home again, you're feeling the fatigue, you're checking that resting heart rate, and it's like 65, 68, so still a little high. Today's session, probably want to be a little more aerobic than going after the intensity. As your body starts to normalize and you get within um, you know, a deviation, I would say, of about between 5 and 10%, um, you can start to say, all right, maybe I can do a little bit of work, see how I respond. Um, and ideally, when you get back to that full rested state, you'll be great. Now, of course, there's other factors associated with stress, um, you know, not just life, but things like uh, dehydr dehydration, poor sleep, um, uh, work stress, all sorts of environmental stresses that can lead to an elevated heart rate. So the more consistent you can be um, in terms of that um, sleep state and measuring that resting heart rate, the better off you'll be. But the point being, you can use resting heart rate as an early bird system to make sure that your body has handled the training load and is prepared to go back to the well and do more work. So in my case, I just finished a block. I've got 10 days and I've got another block in North Carolina. My job is to bridge the gap between these two blocks to recover and stay strong and then add more work on top of it. It does no good for me to continue pushing now, ignoring the stress on my body that my resting heart rate is showing me, setting myself up for failure in that second block. Okay. The best part about resting heart rate is you don't necessarily need a fancy watch. You just need two fingers and a timer and you can count it up and track it in the morning, put it in a spreadsheet, whatever works for you. I'd be really curious to hear from you kind of what your thoughts are around resting heart rate, how you manage it, how you track it, how you found it to be useful, examples where you've seen some outliers in terms of your resting heart rate, and what are some of the changes you've made to your training to make sure that you're back and that you show up 100% every single time that you hit the go button on that watch. This has been Coach Patrick from Endurance Nation. Please check us out online at endurancenation.us. Facebook.com forward slash Endurance Nation, our many race pages like Lake Placid and Chattanooga for this year. Um, and of course, Endurance Nation Live, the Facebook group where we capture all the activity of our athletes training both together in the real world and on virtual places like Swift as well. Talk to you guys. I'll see you soon.